and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th Edition, all while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we'll go over their origins within the game, how they utilize in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. This week we're going to be going over the wizard, the most expensive class in the entirety of Dungeons and Dragons, even more so than the artificer, which is a little bit concerning. Getting right into it, wizards have a 1d6 hit dice, have proficiency in intelligence and wisdom saving throws, and in the use of weapons such as daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, and light crossbows. They can also choose to be proficient in two of the following skills, that being the lore important stuff such as arcana, history, insight, investigation, medicine, and religion. Starting at level 1, the wizard gets access to the Arcane Recovery and Spellcasting class abilities. Arcane Recovery allows you to regain a number of spell slots equal to half your wizard level. This can only be done once per day during a short rest, and can be divided up in any way that you want. Meaning that, for example, if you're a level 8 wizard, you can regain up to 4 spell slots back, and distribute them as 2 second level spell slots, 4 first level spell slots, 1 fourth level spell slot, and all other variants in between. Spellcasting allows you to cast both cantrips and spells from the wizard list. At first level you have two first level spell slots, and your gaining of new spell levels and new spell slots is as follows as you gain wizard levels. For wizards, they are prepared spellcasters, meaning that they can pick and choose which spells they know and can use at the start of each long rest, usually done by consulting their spellbook. Wizards start at level 1 with six first level spells recorded in their spellbook, learning two new spells every time they level up, or when they spend time and money to record a new spell from either another spellbook, a scroll, or some other avenue allowed by the dungeon master. Normally record a new spell requires 2 hours of time devoted to it and 50 gold worth of material per spell level, meaning that you'll need to multiply the time and gold amount spent by the level of the spell that you wish to record. An example being a second level spell takes 10 gold and 4 hours to record, while a fourth level spell may take 200 gold and 8 hours of time to record, and so on and so forth. At level 2, you get to select your Arcane Tradition subclass, whereas most classes usually get it at level 3. This allows you to choose from a monstrous variety of different schools, your options being the School of Abjuration, Blade Singing, Chronergy, Conjuration, Divination, Enchantment, Evocation, Graviturgy, Illusion, Necromancy, Scribes, Transmutation, and War Magic. In terms of number of subclass, I think the wizard is only beat out by the cleric, and each one informs your wizard's research, magical affinity, expertise, and overall knowledge and you gain a new subclass ability from your tradition at levels 2, 6, 10, and 14. At level 3, you may possibly get access to the Cantrip Formula's optional class ability featured in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, provided your Dungeon Master is allowing you to use this rule. Basically, whenever you finish a long rest, you can choose one wizard cantrip you currently have memorized and replace it with another one from the wizard spell list. An important thing to note is that a wizard has access to all cantrips in regards to this ability, and does not need to write them down in their spellbook in order to have access to them like you would level spells. Next, at level 4, wizards can gain either an ability score increase, meaning that they increase one ability score by plus two, or two ability scores by plus one, or alternatively, they can choose a feat if the DM is allowing you to use feats in your game, which adds both customization and versatility to your character, both build and flavor-wise. Later on in this video, we'll go over which specific feats are best for your character when it comes to building a wizard, and you gain an additional ability score increase or feat at levels 8, 12, 16, and 19 for a total of 5. From here on out, it's mostly just gaining new spells and learning new things until you get to level 18, as level 18 wizards get access to the spell mastery class ability, meaning that you can choose a first level wizard spell and a second level wizard spell that are already recorded in your spellbook, and you can cast those spells at their lowest level without expending a spell slot so long as you have them prepared. If you do want to cast either spell at higher level, you must expend the appropriate spell slot to do so, and if you spend 8 hours, you can exchange one or both spells for different ones of the same level from your spellbook. Effectively, this allows you to be able to cast spells on the frequent without expending spell slots from low levels, and is particularly good for useful low level spells such as shield or absorb elements, which offer you a great deal of defensive options at later levels without having to expend those precious spell slots you need to hold on to. And then finally, at level 20, you get Signature Spells, which allows you to choose two third level spells from your spellbook and count them as your signature spells. What this effectively means is that you always have these spells prepared, they don't count against your number of spells that you have prepared in your spellbook, and you can cast each of them at third level without expending a spell slot once per short or long rest. If you wish to cast a spell at higher levels, you do still need to spend the spell slot as usual. When it comes down to it, this is just an empowered version of the earlier spell mastery ability, but does suffer a bit from the problem in that it won't really be used at later levels. Most wizards at 20th level are focusing on spells from 6th level and higher, so a single third level spell that you can use without a long rest is a little iffy for me. With all that out of the way, here are a few of the various Arcane Tradition subclasses for the wizard, all of which can be found in the player's handbook, Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, and Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. The School of Abjuration focuses on deflecting, ignoring, and otherwise nullifying spells and is the best counterspeller in the game, bar none. Bladesingers are an explicitly elven-focused class that wields both blade and spell in the ancient art of blade singing, serving as both a melee and ranged striker with a focus on cantrips and being a better Eldritch Knight than the Eldritch Knight itself. 
Chronergy, or chronoturgy as I like to style it, is centered on the study of time magic, controlling the fates of others through temporal spellcasting and event manipulation in a way that the divination wizard just can't. The School of Conjuration focuses on both summoning creatures to aid you in your adventures and the manipulation of objects, allies, and space through teleportation. Divination wizards are about the old adage of forewarned is forearmed, capable of learning information and discovering the strengths and weaknesses of their enemies from the safety of their scrying orb, as well as being able to infuse their will upon others through the use of portents and predictions. Enchantment wizards take the divination wizards imposing of their will off of the timeline and puts it on individuals themselves, capable of charming people, dominating their targets, removing and manipulating memories, and being better villains than necromancers ever will be. Evocation wizards are the ones that scream fireball at every dark corner that houses at least one goblin, focused on dealing damage while protecting their allies from that same damage while everything else is fair game. Graviturgy magic is an extremely niche school of magic, focusing on the manipulation of gravity and making things heavier, lighter, attracted to one another, and personally having a little bit of too much specific flavor for my taste. Illusionists are a hidden gem amongst wizards, starting out as capable of playing with the five senses before being able to make their dreams a true reality, which has all manner of implications and roleplay and character development potential. Necromancers have kill stealing mechanically built into their class, retaining HP upon reducing enemies to zero, and eventually being able to control undead creatures rather than being forced to kill them. Order of Scribes wizards have some of the most flavorful abilities out of any of the wizard subclasses in my opinion, being armed with a magical quill and an awakened sentient spellbook that eventually becomes a printing press for magical scrolls. Trap Station wizards are the alchemist of the wizard subclasses, focused on changing things into other things, getting a free polymorph, and getting a do-it-all Swiss army stone that keeps you ageless, free of disease, and able to resurrect your allies upon its breaking. That stone is only acquired at high level though, so don't go replacing your clerics just yet. And lastly, we have the War Magic Wizard, which is an arcane combat expert, doing so by admittedly stacking another resource to manage in the form of power surges, which are gained by dispelling and countering other spells while benefiting from things such as splash force damage, armor class bonuses, and a variety of other additional homework to keep track of. When it comes to making a wizard and thinking on the ways you can develop backstories, NPC relationships, and potential goals for them, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Why is your wizard wizard and not some other class? Magic can be acquired by becoming a druid, a cleric, or even a warlock, so why choose the path of wizardry? How did your wizard acquire their components or their spellbook or the money required to be a wizard? Are they a noble? Did they lie, cheat, and steal to get where they are? Do they have a patron who expects them to eventually use their new skills to serve their interest? And finally, why does your wizard study the school they have chosen? And why do they view it necessary to study and practice that specific school of magic? Why would a necromancer risk being denounced and burned at the stake? Why would a chronology time wizard wish to master and turn back time? Try to think of these beyond just your subclass's mechanics and figure out what kind of problems your chosen school can provide the solutions for, as well as what goals they intend to accomplish using their newly acquired magic. Next, we're going to cover some of the great feats that wizards can use when building them over the course of your game. Due to the wizard's niche focus on spellcasting, these feats are a little bit more specific rather than the general lists I normally provide with these videos. First off, we have Actor, which is perfect for illusion or enchantment wizards who are looking to layer some voice acting onto their visual, mental, and auditory deceptions. Alert is very great to avoid being caught off guard and down to 0 HP in the first round because you were surprised and rolled low on initiative. Elemental Adept is ideal for evocation wizards who wish to stick to one damage type without compromising effectiveness or versatility. Metamagic Adept, Magic Initiate, Fey Touched, and Shadow Touched add some additional spells and abilities to your toolkit, while the last two can provide some story elements in explaining why they were affected by the energies of the Feywild or the Shadowfell. Keen Mind is mostly just a great feat for flavor and depicting a hyper-intelligent mind. And finally, Spell Sniper and Warcaster are the bread and butter for any wizard, allowing you to ignore cover, have longer ranges for your spells, and allowing you to use your reaction to cast spells instead of attack an enemy when they provoke an attack of opportunity from you. Now these are just a few of my personal favorites. If you guys have feats that you guys like to use for your wizards, please let me know what I've missed down in the comments. Next we're going to have a couple of character examples that I've made for you guys to use, either as inspiration for your next PC or NPC if you're a dungeon master. First, we have the Planar Warden, a wizard who has dedicated their life to the study, tracking, and removal of extraplanar creatures. Traumatized by the summoning of a demon by wayward cultists who had seen their village burn to cinders by hellfire. This wizard could be a conjuration wizard who has taken an approach of fight fire with fire by summoning their own creatures whose interests align with their own, or an abjuration wizard specializing in the banishing of these creatures and locking down of cultist mages leading the summoning in the first place. Regardless, their goal is to keep the denizens of the material plane safe from things beyond the material, be it fiends, celestials, fey, aberrations, or whatever else. They may assist the party in taking down a demonic cult, breaking the enchantments of a powerful fey, or even banishing angels who get a little bit too comfortable exacting their brand of celestial justice upon the common people. 
Next, we have the Untouchable, a wizard who is ingrained in all manner of horrible act from memory wiping to mental domination to causing all manner of horrid event to occur, but is entirely unsuspected and always manages to escape scot-free even when they and their plans are discovered. This could be a divination wizard who sees time as a game of chess that they can manipulate and master, knowing every outcome and its fringe sub-branches before even having to make a move. Or it could be an enchantment wizard who has used their power to control other people's minds, perhaps by having his victims work as assassins or thralls only to have no memory of their actions once the horrid deed has been carried out. And then there is always the good Wizard of Oz illusionist wizard. All this is to say that this is your man behind the curtain, an overarching force that the PCs will never discover unless the villains want them to, or if they're particularly clever. I use these sorts of villains all the time in my games, exploring how their effects on people's minds can leave them forgetful, fragmented, and prone to further mental degradation. But anyway, the last character that we have is the Dream Chaser, a wizard whose goal is to use their study of magic to change or produce a specific outcome. Perhaps a Carnotaurus wishes to turn back time to undo a mistake that had occurred in his youth, or a Transmutation Wizard wishes to create a Transmuter Stone in order to save a relative from a deadly disease. Or maybe an Illusion Wizard simply wants to put on a big production play without having to pay big production costs and hire big production actors, almost able to be a literal one-man show if he gets strong enough. With this character, magic isn't the wizard's goal, it's the tool that they use to reach their goal, and so they'll do anything that they need to to acquire more power and knowledge to put it towards his purpose. I say this because wizards are at the crux of most of D&D's fantasy with characters like Elminster, Snellock, Vecna, and Mordekane and literally shaping the world with their actions and arcane knowledge. And I would qualify that all those characters I just listed are dream chasers who sought their own ends using magic and wizardry. Before we get into our homebrew magic item for this evening, here's a couple that would serve as great rewards for wizard PCs or as tools that wizard NPCs would wield during combat. Tasha's Cauldron of Everything really delivered a ton of cool tomes and items, so I highly recommend checking all of them out. But for a homebrew magic item in this video, we have the Wand of Eldritch Wizardry, named after one of the older classic legendary magazines from D&D's first days. Made to accentuate a wizard's arcane power, the wand is formed out of a black calcified wood-like material from the Far Realm, functioning mostly as a plus one wand of the War Mage that requires attunement and bears the following additional effects. While attuned to this item, your arcane recovery can now regain a number of spells equal to your full wizard level rather than your half. And whenever you cast a spell using this item as your spellcasting focus, you may use your bonus action to cast a wizard cantrip that you know on a target within range, so long as the cantrip is of the same school as the spell you just cast to activate this effect. Now I already know people are going to whine about how casters are already overpowered in 5e, but there are a lot of cantrips in game that are underutilized due to their requirement of an action, such as blade ward, sword burst, and even true strike. While well, yes, you can simply take another damaging cantrip to increase your output, I'd recommend using this to accentuate your school casting. For instance, an abjuration wizard who just tanked a red dragon's fire breath using absorb elements can now bestow resistance using blade ward on their fighter companion against the dragon's upcoming claw and tail attacks. Or a divination wizard who just used mind spike can bestow the same fighter with a higher chance to hit using true strike. It offers the wizard a little bit more to do with their bonus action while letting the school based restriction prevent it from being a little bit too powerful. I've included the item stat block in the description below, and that's the wizard class, everybody. I want to thank all of you guys for watching, and if you guys enjoyed the video, please like, share, subscribe, and press the little bell icon to be updated on future videos, and also let me know about your guys' wizard characters or experiences with wizards in the comment section below. What's your favorite subclass? What's your favorite wizard item? What's your favorite classic D&D wizard character? And if you guys want to vote on the subject of the next video, you can follow the link in the description to do so and cast your vote in the polls. And also let me know what you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.